Tonight's speaker is Janan L. Hifnawi with the uh, U.S. Uh, Geological Society the Inventory and Monitoring Lab, and she's going to be talking about um, the Ask a Bumblebee project. And I um, am one of the uh, surveyors from last year. I did probably a handful of surveys, and I'm anxious to um, find out what you found out. Thank you for coming. Okay, thank you so much for having me. I mean, it is so exciting that people want to listen to me talk about this project that I love so much. So I'm honored to get this hour of everybody's time and I hope that you find what I have to say interesting. Um, I will say I was so like, it was so exciting for me to see in last month's presentation, um, you all talk about some of your results from Ask a Bumblebee. So I was like, I need to repay my dedicated group of surveyors. And I was like, let me get all of the data from 2022 in and analyzed so I can present it today. Let me tell you, I did not accomplish that. <laughs> it was an ambitious goal. And I'm excited that you guys like gave me the push because now things are almost there but it's not quite there, but I think it's a pretty good trade. I have some other, um, I have our preliminary results and some other ways to inform bumblebee plantings that um, particularly a website that our botanist created, I will plug at the end, which is a super great way to uh, guide your plantings. And I thought I could trade the time talking about our results to throwing in some fun bee facts which I really am excited about. And I hope you guys are too, because I think there's a lot of misconceptions about general bee biology, but all right, I guess I'll get into it if everybody is ready. Okay, here is my presentation. Um, I love to call this the ominous bee face because I think it's just kind of intimidating looking for a bumblebee, but without further ado. Um, so I'm Janae El Hifnawi. Um, so I thought I would start with a little bit of who am I, and part of my motivation in this is to emphasize that I am not really an expert on bees or bumblebees even. I um, coordinate this really exciting project, but this was really the beginning of my entrance to the insect world. I finished my undergrad at University of Maryland um, in 2022, and as much as I love Ask a Bumblebee, it unfortunately does not pay the bills. So I, uh, four days a week, am a lab tech at University of Maryland. I'm in the Espindola lab where I'm doing a genetic study on the Baltimore checker spot butterfly, which is a super cool um, regionally endangered pollinator. And I would love to talk more about the checker spot if people have questions and we have time at the end. Um, if we don't have time, I will just say plant white turtle head flower because that's the only host plant that it will lay its eggs on. So in the fall, I will be continuing in the same lab at UMD, but uh, moving into a master's project. So I'll become a student again in the fall, and I will be doing a phylogeographic study on 10 bee species from the Southern Andes. And phylogeography is a very scary word, but um, basically all I'll be doing is sequencing some DNA from specimens of these 10 species and then building sort of like a family tree of each species and exploring how uh, the geographic history of the region could have impacted their speciation and their range and things like that. So again, if people have questions on the other things, just feel free to ask at the end. But now we can get into bee facts. So um, yeah, I thought before talking about bumblebees, um, I should just kind of cover some basic bee things. My own parents don't really like still haven't drilled at home that honeybees are not all bees. I think there's so much media about honeybees that we all um, really just generalize the information that we have. And I'm speaking for myself. Maybe you all know more than I did a year and a half ago, but um, yeah, basically Sneak peek, a lot of things that we think about bees are only true for honeybees. So the first fact, there are just under 4,000 species of bees in the US and around 400 species in Maryland. So while we think of them as being 
just kind of bees. Maybe we don't think about it so much how diverse they are. They're an incredibly diverse group. And there's a lot of um, differences in lifestyle traits and ecology within this. The photo I included here is the mouth of an agochlora bee. So if you see these little, little I say, the big mandibles at the bottom here, those are what it would use to chew things. And you can see it's quite hairy and bumpy. But yeah, there's most bees are not what we conceptualize bees as, where they're yellow and black and stripy. A lot of them are shiny or just the majority are small, black, about the size of a grain of rice. Only honeybees make honey. So that is something that I did not know until recently. Um, sneak peek. Uh, yeah, and I think it's kind of why honeybees get so much attention, as well as the fact that honeybees have such massive um, hives that are good for agriculture. So this is a really cool one, I think. Honeybees are the only bees that die when they sting you. And I included, this is a honeybee stinger. So if you can see, it's barbed. It has um, these little like serrations almost. And those would mean that the stinger will get stuck in your body and be ripped out of the bee's abdomen if it stings you. And that is why honeybees will die. And this is an aspect, again, of their huge colony size. So it is evolutionarily beneficial for honeybees to do as much damage to you as possible as a mammal, even if it is at their own expense. So if you think about a honeybee hive, it will be thousands of bees with lots of larva and um, some honey. So that is a big meal for a bear or a badger or another large mammal that would be, you know, walking by and hungry. So things like wasps and ants and honeybees that have these massive nests that are high reward um, for hungry mammals, they had to evolve defenses against mammals. So that's where you find things like the barb stinger, where that is targeting large things like us. And if you think of a solitary bee, which the majority of those 4,000 bee species in the U.S., are um, solitary bees where it's one female to a nest um, and she will just have around under a hundred um, other bees within her that nest. So that is going to be hard to find hidden away somewhere and it's not really a big reward. So most solitary bees and bumblebees are not really of interest to um, hungry mammals and they never had to evolve these defenses. Along the same lines, there's no known allergies to solitary bees. And sorry, I realize now I didn't really define solitary bees. So honeybees are the only truly, truly social bees where they have um, these giant hives with a queen and complicated roles, uh, which different castes doing their own jobs. Bumblebees um, are sort of the second most social group of bees under honeybees, they do have hives of around 30 to 400 on average. Um, and they do have some level of role assignment. So there is a queen and uh, there are workers and males, but they're not quite as complex in their social structure as honeybees are. But so other than bumblebees are sort of this weird middle ground, but other than those two groups, the rest of bees are solitary pretty much. And they will have these really tiny nests. And again, because there are no mammals bothering them, they did not have to evolve chemical defenses towards mammals. So this is where we see there are no known allergies to solitary bees. All of the known bee allergies are honeybees. And I will note that we only have one species of honeybee in the US. It's the European honeybee, Apis mellifera. So 20% of known bee species are nest parasites. This photo is a nomada. It is a, a nest parasite, you may have guessed. And what that means is that they will lay their eggs in the nest of another bee to sort of mooch on the other bee's resources. And they will then uh, likely kill the larva of the original host and consume all the food that the queen, the 
female bee had provisioned for that offspring. And yeah, it's a pretty interesting, sneaky lifestyle that is super common, apparently. I also like this guy, how it almost looks like it's a halo. Like, I'm not a nest parasite. I'm an angel. So another great bee fact and another great bee photo. This one I think looks like a mustache. Um, so all bees evolved from wasps, which I say partly to give points to wasps because they are not as beloved as our bees, which there are some super cool ones and they are pollinators as well. But yeah, wasps are the ancestral group to bees and ants. So all bees and all ants evolved from wasps. This one is a little bit more uh, flower related. So I'm, I would, I'm curious um, how many of you know these facts already, one. And two, as we get into more um, sort of planting relevant facts, I feel like maybe people would be more familiar with them because it seems more relevant to you group of planty folks. But this one I really enjoy. Bees can't see red. They do see UV as a color, but with them not seeing red, any flowers that you see that are a bright red are typically thought to be bird pollinated because otherwise it, it doesn't make much sense for a flower to evolve to be this color that bees perceive sort of as a grayscale. So bees do see like yellow and blue and white, and you will often see bees visiting flowers that are those colors. And this is a thing that is sort of called pollination syndromes. Um, yeah, and I think it's super funky that you can really just see the evolution right before your eyes. This guy, I love this photo. This is an oil collecting bee. It has this long tongue, that long arc, that is its tongue that it uses to collect oils from deep inside some flower. But yeah, not all bees are interested in nectar. Some forage for floral oils, uh, which I'm particularly kind of interested in. And those I'll be focusing on some of those with my master's project. Um, and then there are even some carnivorous bees, which I don't know much about these at all, but apparently they exist. So that's pretty crazy. 35% of known pollen collecting bees are specialists. And what this means is that they are specialized on a certain narrow range of plants. So often like there will be a spring beauty specialist bee that only visits uh, species in the genus Claytonia or the spring beauties. And this, I think, is a very planting relevant one because it goes to show that bees are selective and it does matter not just that you have flowers, but that you have the right flowers. This one, I think we know probably, but if you want to help bees, plant native plants. Again, this sort of goes back to ecology or evolution where things that evolve together likely have um, some longstanding relationship and they have developed ways that they interact. So typically, um, if you plant native plants, they will have great interactions with the native insects that are hopefully present in your area. So this takes us back to AABB and ends our series of fun bee facts. I hope you guys like the bee facts. I love them, but I kind of like bees more than the average person. So ask a bumblebee. Our big question is sort of addressing those last two slides. Which flowers should we be planting for bumblebees? This is something I thought we totally knew already. Bumblebees are so charismatic as far as insects go, and they're quite common. So I would imagine many of you, if you have interest in planting, um, would have some species in mind that you're like, I know bumblebees love those plants. These are good ones. But as much as that is good information to have, it's not super uh, like rigorous or the most scientific method. So that tends to sort of skew some of our understanding of the bumblebee preference. A lot of the existing information on this question is from observational things or studies that don't consider what flowers were present and not visited. And that sounds like why would those be relevant? They didn't get visitation. But what it really comes down to is if you don't know what else was available and you're just looking at what did get visitation, maybe it's a last choice. If you see a bumblebee on a white clover, 
cool. Maybe they like white clover or maybe there's not another flower in the surrounding square mile and they're hungry. Who knows? So we are trying to get at this question and we want to do it with a highly accessible community science survey on bumblebee and carpenter bee floral preference. Um, we're throwing carpenter bees in there, one, because they're interesting and cool native bees as well, uh, but two, because they are easily confused with bumblebees. So we want to make sure that our participants can tell them apart and are not just lumping them all together. But what I really love about this survey, aside from the fact that I think it's fun that you can do it in your own yard or a botanical garden or anywhere else you choose, is that it truly is quite accessible. I don't think you need to know much about um, bees or plants to get started. I will admit, if you know your plants, it's a little easier to keep track of all the plants you've seen and to identify everything. But I knew very, very little when I started doing this survey and by using seek to identify my plants, which then a botanist does confirm that because I know seek is not 100% accurate. Um, yeah, I, I could participate without really knowing anything. And it was a super fun way for me to learn our local bumblebee species and um, some local plants. And also in being so accessible, we can really try to collect a huge amount of data. So that is awesome. And it so far seems to be going well. We collected um, around a thousand surveys so far with over, I would say roughly 850 of them are in the Northeast US and ready to be analyzed in the coming months. So that should be super exciting uh, to get those results. And I will definitely share them with you all. So how to do a survey. I hope that um, along with my year one surveyors, we are potentially getting some new folks here. So I'll go into some detail about how to actually do a survey, but if you have any questions on the procedure, feel free to ask. And again, uh, feel free to interrupt me at any point. I would love to hear from you all or you know, have things be interactive. If you have any questions, yeah, just chime in. But so to actually do a survey, you want to pick any area. It could be urban, it could be suburban, it could be totally wild. And I really want to emphasize that. You could do the survey anywhere. Our funding is for the Northeast US. So that is where we are paid to do the entry and analysis. Um, we will do the entry and analysis from everything beyond the Northeast US, but we will be doing it more on our own time because it will have to be secondary to employment. But it is so exciting that you can do the survey anywhere. Generally speaking, you want to have enough flowers that you could walk around for around 30 minutes without just like standing and staring at the ground in one spot for the whole time. But I've done it um, in Georgetown on the waterfront. I do it in my yard. Some friends of Sligo Creek folks have done it in your newly established pollinator gardens. So that's super exciting. And I will note that it is great to repeatedly survey the same sites. It also is great to survey different sites. That's really up to you. But for things like your community gardens, it's super awesome if we get lots of data from somewhere like that because it is just what we look for in terms of lots of diverse pollinator plants present. Um, lots of them are already identified. And then if we get repeated surveys of the same areas, we don't need to have the botanist review the flowers again. So that saves us some time and some money because the botanist review is where most of our funding goes because that's some very highly skilled labor. So a plug, do lots of surveys in your yard and your community gardens and we will be very happy. So back to how to survey. Once you've picked your area, you really just wander around wherever you want for 30 minutes. There's no transects or area measurements or anything like that. You can just wander where you want and you want to record every flower species that you pass that's currently in bloom, regardless of bee visitation. And if you don't know how to identify plants, you can use an app like Seek. If you do, great, use your own knowledge and everything will be reviewed. So it's not super high stakes that you get it right the first time. So as you're walking, you obviously want to keep an eye out for bumblebees and carpenter bees, and then you just tally visitation to 
whatever plant they are visiting. Um, and then finally, at the end, we have two estimations to quantify what flowers were available. Um, one is for floral abundance and one is for distribution of your flowers. And I can get into that if people have questions. But if not, I will just move on to some of our results. So now that we know some B basics, what a survey looks like, um, I will get into the data we have collected so far. So in 2021, we did a complete pilot year uh, where it was 12 collectors, but most of these surveys were from myself and my lovely boss, Sam Drogi, um, as well as a couple very dedicated collectors. But um, we finished the survey protocol in June. So we were really just doing lots of focus groups and um, doing lots and lots of iterations to try to make the protocol be as fun and accessible as possible. So between June through October, when I stopped seeing bees, we got 97 surveys, which is not too bad for a pilot year. Um, they were in six states and Washington, D.C. Uh, we had 12 collectors, as I mentioned, and we saw eight bumblebee species and 445 plant taxa. But I will note that the plant taxa um, number is a little bit arbitrary because it includes things that are identified to species, genus, family, and so on. So you'll have both like Baptisia australis and Baptisia species as different taxa included in that number. So 2022, we also, we, we took it right from the beginning of the season because the protocol was done. So we started March and we went all the way through the end of the season in October. And in that period, we got 1,060 surveys. So that is super exciting. I really can't believe that in our first year, we collected this much data. It is crazy. It is way better than I expected, as you may have guessed, based on the fact that I am not done analyzing my data. But anyway, we had 530 amazing registered participants, including some of you all. But unfortunately, these 1,060 surveys are not all done and analyzed. But what I do have for you today is the spring results. So I was able to finish analyzing the results from March through May, and that was only 108 surveys. So I will emphasize that these are quite preliminary. It's basically a similar number of surveys to our pilot year. I think there's there tend to be like low survey rates in the spring, and I imagine that's because uh, the spring bumblebee populations tend to be lower because it's just queens emerging and the first generation of workers. So bumblebee populations really start to get up there um, in June, I would say. So up through May, I don't think as many people are spotting bumblebees and being like, ooh, let me start surveying because I see them and I'm interested. But there are some bees out. So if people are going to survey, I encourage you to start right from the first bumblebee you see so we can really get a full picture of not only what they're using um, throughout the whole season, but also particularly if the queens that emerge right from the wind, uh, just earliest in spring, it's only queens out. So anything we see in really early spring, it's kind of particularly interesting to me to see, do queens maybe have slightly different floral preference than the workers and males, or are we just going to see nothing surprising. Who knows? But anyway, so these 108 surveys were from eight states plus Washington, D.C., but the majority are from Maryland and Virginia. We had 30 collectors in the spring, and we saw nine bumblebee species. Here we had 544 plant taxa across 281 genera. So some bees. Um, in 2021, so this is the fall of 2021 because we only managed to get the survey up and running in, I said June, let me double check. June, yes. So this was from June through October. We saw a lot of bees. It was 2,689. And these were the species we saw. So I will note that Bombus impatiens is the most common bumblebee species in our region and they represented the vast, vast majority of this count. 
Yeah. I'll also point out that some people did identify bees to species and to sex, but we have lots that are just Bombus species sex unknown. So we really encourage folks who don't know bumblebee species ID or bumblebee sex ID to still participate. All you have to know is that's a bumblebee. That's not a bumblebee, which we believe you can accomplish even if you have no exposure to bees in around a day. I think it's pretty easy to figure out. And we have lots of resources available on our website to figure that out. So now 2022, this was the spring. We saw 1,093 bees. So not too bad for the, the 100 surveys and relatively low uh, bumblebee populations. So here we saw, again, lots of bombus and patients, but also lots of bimaculatus, which is another common group in our area. And those are the two spotted bumblebee, if you've ever noticed that. Yeah. Now I can get into a fun section where I will... It's almost like a quiz, but fun. So I will show you uh, photos of two different flower species. We'll start with spring and then we'll move into the fall. And I'll ask you guys to raise your hand for the flower that you think got more visitation. So we have golden ragwort versus golden Alexander. So Raise your hand if you think golden ragwort got more visits than golden Alexander. All right, we got one. We got a couple. And I'll just do it this way where I'll ask you guys one and then the default, the people who are not raising their hands, I will assume are voting for golden Alexander. So what's our answer? Golden ragwort wins. But I will note these are both quite low scores. Neither one of these really was popular among the bumblebees, which maybe some of you knew, and that makes it kind of tricky to guess, I think, when it's not one great one and one bad one. They're both kind of meh in terms of bumblebees. I do want to uh, clarify, though, that things that are not preferred by bumblebees are not necessarily bad plants. There are lots of plants that bumblebees don't like and specialist bees are specialized on, so that is essential to them. Or there are lots of plants that are not native to the area and bumblebees love them. So who's to say that you should only plant to cater to bumblebees? It's also good to consider your other pollinators and other types of bugs. Okay, next one. So we have white clover versus spring beauty. So who thinks that spring beauty got more visits than white clover did in the springtime? Okay, this one was a little bit mean. It was a trick question. Neither one had any visitation at all in our spring surveys. So you guys might be thinking, I know bumblebees visit white clover. Maybe you've also seen a bumblebee visit uh, spring beauty. I have never seen a bumblebee visit spring beauty personally, but this is where things get a little interesting for me. I have seen lots of bumblebees visit white clover, but I have only seen it a little bit later in the year. We saw plenty of visits in the fall and this year I've been keeping an eye out and I saw some really close to like the end of May, but I haven't seen any visits in um, early spring. So could that just be an artifact of the fact that we only have a hundred uh, or so surveys? Quite possibly. Maybe that is just a lack of data, but I think it could potentially suggest that bumblebee queens aren't really interested in white clover while workers and males are, or another sort of funky trend that's a little bit more complex than that, that we aren't aware of at this point. So to sort of demonstrate this, I'll have another comparison. Now we're moving into the fall data. Here we have white clover again, this time versus purple coneflower. So who thinks purple, clo purple coneflower got more visits than white clover did in the fall? We got some hands because you would think, one, we saw no bees on white clover in the spring, and two, purple coneflower is a solid plant that we see bees on. However, white clover got more visits. And this isn't to say that uh, purple coneflower is not a good plant. I do think that it gets plenty of visits. That's one that I, I feel like I've seen a difference on like the cultivar level almost, or maybe I'm just thinking that 
the pale purple cone flower I've noticed gets more visits than this guy, but that's just an observation, not part of our data. So who knows if that will hold true um, with the math, but yeah, so I do think that this sort of suggests an interesting trend about white clover that it is a viable candidate in the fall and in the spring, despite the abundance of beautiful, fresh looking white clovers very little to no visitation. So that's something that I'm really excited to get some more data um, and be able to look at that question a little bit more because maybe it is just an artifact, but I will say Sam, my boss who knows a lot more than I do, thought that that was funky and likely represented some sort of trend. So who knows, stay tuned and go do surveys with white clover in the spring. So we have another one here. We have common yarrow, and you might be thinking that's not yarrow, but this is just one floret. So it's not a very representative photo of the flower maybe, but I thought it was cool. So we have yarrow versus creeping thistle. Between these two, do you think yarrow got, raise your hand if you think yarrow got more visits than creeping thistle. Okay, we got some hands, but we got also some, some thistle no hands. <laughs> For this guy, Creeping Thistle wins. But this was another one that really surprised me. I would have thought that both of these would have um, pretty solid numbers. Yarrow is frequently recommended in bumblebee mixes or referred to as like, oh, casually, this is a good bumblebee plant. And these are the things that we are sort of trying to weed out of the recommendations. What are things that it's just a common plant that people have maybe seen a bumblebee land on? So then they're like, that's a good one. Let's recommend it. When really, if there are a broad palette of plants available, it's not going to get much visitation. But again, this is not too much data. So who knows how things will look when we get some more. Creeping thistle, I also feel like I see bees visit. So this surprised me a lot. But I think some of my confusion is that I can't tell the difference between some of the thistles between each other. And then also like there's a, a clover that confuses me or something. I don't know, my plant ID is quite poor. So maybe some of that uh, lack of ID skill is what made this so shocking to me. But yeah, I found these pretty surprising. Um, okay, I think this is our last one. So we have wild geranium uh, versus common blue violet. So who thinks that wild geranium got more visits? Raise your hand. Very few hands. And folks are generally right. We didn't see any bees on wild geranium, which this is another one that I sort of would have thought would have got at least a couple. Um, and come blue violet wasn't a super winner, but it did okay, got some visits. I think this is the end. Yes, okay. So now we can get into some actual more statistically things. Although I will say our analysis is super basic. We just um, do a series of basic calculations in Excel to try to like correct for how much um, a plant was available, whether that's how many surveys it was on or the actual volume of flowers available in a survey. But it's super basic Excel calculations. If anybody's interested in the details on that, I'd be happy to share the Excel files we use or a document where I sort of talk through it a little bit. Um, but okay, favorite plants of 2021. So our number one plant in the fall of 2021 was cup plant, which I hadn't heard of at all until this. And Sam loves it. There's a bunch of the bee lab. So now I've seen a bit of it, but yeah, it's kind of a, a funky one that you don't hear about too much. It's called cup plant because the leaves uh, are totally connected and it forms sort of like a cup that will hold some rainwater and stuff. And this, it was a winner. It had lots of visitation and it is actually, I believe not technically native to Maryland, but it is native to Virginia. So that poses sort of an interesting question on how to interpret nativity and how we should guide our recommendations based on nativity because You'll see in this list, we have some serious non-native plants to invasive plants that kind of made the cut. So 
clearly we don't want to recommend invasives, but I would guess that many of you have encountered the discussion on what native means and do we care about native to the state or native to east of the Mississippi or how do we want to look at these things? Food for thought. But aside from that little tangent, short tooth mountain mint was super popular, which if you are into bees and plants, I don't think you'll find that too surprising. It tends to be quite popular. Sam calls it BTV because you can just watch them and it's entertaining. Again, not too surprising. We have wild, mer wild bergamot and goldenrod. Those I think we sort of knew to be winners going in. So I'm. it's nice to see that the what we're seeing um, in real life, the actual ecology is matching the numbers. And red clover, not native. So what to do about that? Something I have not thought about yet. So medium plants of 2021. These were sort of the runner-ups. Bone set, Joe Pieweed, wing stem. Not too surprising. I think those are great. And yeah, we like them. They're good. Not quite as popular as the favorites, but they totally did well. And I would say are probably worth planting if you want a diverse bumblebee friendly yard. Here's where things get a little bit spicy. Porcelain berry. Nobody plant porcelain berry, please. I would imagine nobody was going to do it even if we told you to. It is a super aggressive invasive vine. It's I hear about it from some like restorationists who are trying to establish like there are these garbage islands. This is a real tangent, but there are these islands that basically people have piled up garbage and it's like a dump site. And then you put dirt, I guess, and try to just make it like a little ecologically functional island. And porcelain berry is one of the top issues in sites like that, where it's just like lots of disturbed habitat Porcel porcelain berry will just take over consume everything it is not our friend but the bumblebees seem to visit it so again how we want to interpret that I think is a really interesting question that I'm sort of excited by even though it's a little bit disheartening maybe that it is such a it made it to the medium plants list I would hope that we would have so many great diverse natives that none of the invasives would have been present enough to make it on this list, but alas, it's here. And um, great coworker at the Bee Lab, Claire Maffey, suggested that maybe we can use information like this to sort of select what invasives we will put our money into fighting. So I think that that's not something I would feel confident just totally recommending now, but I think in conservation, typically the issue is money. So if we are in a situation where we have to pick which invasive do you want to uh, tackle and which do you want to just unfortunately let go, maybe we want to let go the one that the bumblebees happen to like. Who knows? Maybe that is not a good answer because it will take over everything else. But the situation I'm posing, getting rid of everything is not an option. So would you rather have the one that's getting visited or leave the aggressive invasive that's not getting visited? I think probably keep the visited one. Okay, so some not so favorite plants of 2021. This I think is super surprising and I feel like gets at the motivation of this project existing where if you have seen a bumblebee seed mix, chances are you'll have some black eyed Susan in there. And it wasn't a zero, but if we go back a slide, Bone said had 209. Back another slide. Cup plant 264. We're down to 43 for Black Eyed Susan. That is not a top choice. So as much as you'll see it recommended, if your goal is bumblebees, that's not the plant I would recommend personally. Common dandelion, one. How, that's about as low, low of a score as you can get. And again, bump, dandelions are often thought of as being bee friendly. I mean, if you're going to either have a completely mowed lawn or a lawn of dandelions, sure, that's better. But if you are going to have either a lawn of dandelions or a lawn of mountain mint and goldenrod and minarda and cup plant, go with the second one. Um, wax begonia and Queen Anne's lace and fleabane, 
Fleabane and Queen, Queen Anne's Lace I hear sometimes recommended, so we threw those in. And Wax Begonia, I think, just goes to show that some of these ornamental plants are really not ecologically functional. So now we are into the top plants of 2022. Um, Beard's Tongue, Fox Love Beard's Tongue was our number one. And that I'm really feeling like it's holding true this year. I have some in my yard and the bee lab, they have some big plots and ooh, it is swarming with bumblebees. They love this guy and it makes sense, I guess. Uh, yeah, so that had a super high score. Although I will say the scores between years are not super comparable. So I wouldn't necessarily say that this is like twice as good as cup plant or anything, but it is by far the top plant of uh, 2022 spring. And remember that all the 2022 data is only the spring. So that's what you're seeing. After Beard's Tongue Ground Ivy. Crazy. This guy, I'm, I don't think is native. It definitely is a weedy one. Uh, some people call it gill over the ground, if you haven't heard of these common names. But this was super interesting to see because it seemed like it was the the top choice for queen food, as far as what I saw. In my earliest surveys, where all I was seeing was big, chunky queens, this was the top plant. It was really the only place that I was finding bees in lots of my spring surveys when I knew it was only queens out. So interesting. Is it... Um, I'm kind of curious if it was present later in the season, would queens or would workers and males be just as interested in it as the queens were? Or is there something specific about this plant and about the needs of queens as they're establishing their new nests that makes it a, desir a desirable food plant? Who knows? Um, high bush blueberry. This one's not too surprising. It's another good one. Catnip species. Catmint species. Catnip is a Nepeta species. I need to correct that. But the catmints are, again, non-native, but I see lots of visitation. And I think any it, it's a mint. We love our mints. And by we, I mean the bees. And I love what the bees love. <laughs> but yeah, this guy, it's non-native. So another question of what do we want to do about this? Who knows? And blue false indigo did quite well as well. So some medium plants in 2021. Purple dead nettle, dandelion did a little better this year. Who knows why that is, if it just is an artifact of low survey numbers or a trend in seasons, something to explore as we collect more data. Woodland sage, more mints we love. Common blue violet and daffodils, I was kind of surprised made it to the medium. I would have thought that those might be a not so favorite, but it is a pretty low score, especially if we're comparing to things like this 461. We're down to like a tenth of that, but still it got some visits and the not so favorite plants of 2022. Spring Beauty got nothing. But again, Spring Beauty is not a bad plant. There is a Spring Beauty specialist and without it, that that whole bee group would be extinct. So definitely we want Spring Beauty, but the bumblebees don't necessarily. Wild geranium, garden pansy, red columbine, and white clover all at zero. And I feel like I have talked your ears off about white clover, but yeah, here it is sitting at zero. What's next for us? Uh, so unfortunately, we do not have funding for this coming year, but that's okay because it is quite an affordable project. And um, Sam always is really emphasizing that the only thing that needs to happen right away is data collection. The, the bees of 2023 will only be here in these coming months. Um, and then after that, it's too late to collect information on what happened in terms of floral visitation this uh, summer and fall. The things that are expensive are the botanical review. But we can really collect the data and hold on to it until we do get some money. And then we can do all the analysis without any holes in our data. So I'm still continuing to survey. I'm still encouraging people to survey. I think that we could still have a great year. And I'm going to continue working in terms of data entry and processing and stuff as a volunteer. I love this project. I think that it should continue. So I'm happy to do it. And, you know, I'll have, I have my four day a week job and stuff. So things will be continuing. And on a more positive note, we are looking at a big grant uh, with 
Fish and Wildlife Service um, for 2024. So if all goes well, we could have a bunch of money next year, and then we can really get the botanical review done, do some more um, outreach and promotion and really get lots of data, hire some people to help me with the data entry and analysis would be lovely. Um, yeah, so hopefully big things to come. This year, while I said we have no funding, we did get a grant from the Maryland Native Plant Society. Thank you, Maryland Native Plant Society. Um, and that is to establish a Ask a Bumblebee garden. So at the Bee Lab, we are building a garden that will be 25 equal size small plots, each one with a different plant species that was one of our top plants from our preliminary data. So that'll be super exciting, one, to create some good bumblebee habitat, uh, have a good survey site with lots of diversity, and then also to see if having all of these bumblebee favorite plants in a small area impacts uh, visitation. I think there could be some complexities in the ecology that we're unaware of that may be doing everything um, in this new setup where it's like, basically the question is, if you have a bumblebee tailored garden, does visitation to that within that garden look the same as visitation in just your normal habitats that aren't tailored to bumblebees? So who knows how that will uh, pan out? I'm curious to see. So another exciting thing that we're working on right now is I am talking with um, this great guy, Steve, um, who is developing an app. So this app will be garden monitoring. Um, you'll input your site conditions and you can do like your house or something. And then it will tell you what plants are good for your area, what insects you could look out for visiting those and locations that you could purchase those plants. So that's super exciting. I, I hope everything works out. It's really a startup and quite in the early stages right now. So who knows how that will all play out, but I believe in Steve. I think that it is a cool project and it sounds like some pretty good goals. He really wants to make the goal sort of to connect people with native plant nurseries and uh, promote business with those nurseries. And then within the app, he's going to have some community science components. So hopefully you could complete the survey on his app, which would be really nice. Finally, we want to just keep investigating some interesting plants and interesting trends, like what I was talking about with the white clover and things like that. And we want to collaborate with groups like you, or, um, you know, if you have any other recommendations of groups that you think would be interested, let me know. And hopefully we want to expand a across the entire country and maybe Canada. We're hoping that maybe an NGO like Pollinator Partnership or something would consider picking us up or we'll see where the future takes us, but I feel, I feel hopeful about this. And then finally, here is the uh, Facebook page of Steve's Garden, the app that I was talking about. If you wanna stay tuned to any progress on that front, feel free to follow. And then as promised, how can you help bumblebees is to plant native plant or bumblebee preferred plants that are um, blooming throughout the entire season. You don't want to have a bunch of plants in the spring and then have basically a food desert in the fall with nothing blooming where they're all left to die essentially. To pick the right plants, this is what I promised. This is the site that our botanist Jared Fowler made. It's super awesome. You input your site conditions and things that you're looking for about your flowers. You don't have to fill all these fields. I don't recommend you do because that will be a super narrow um, restricted list of plants. But yeah, it'll tell you flowers that Bumblebee's like. He reviewed all of the flowers in our data. So he did some of this just sort of with what he saw in our data. And then also he is an expert botanist with lots of other experience and he incorporated other uh, databases into these recommendations. This is a little fun slide I include of my crazy boss. He says, no ecologist ever said the words, what I recommend in this refuge is more lawn. Really the answer is planting flowers and transforming your habitat that you can into things that could be ecologically functional. The end. Thank you so much for listening, guys. I can't believe I actually made it to 758. That's crazy. I will let, I assume Elaine has some things to say, so I will stop talking now, but thank you so much for listening. And I'll put these things in the chat that people just asked for. Yes, that was wonderful. Thank you so much.
So there's um, some comments and questions in the chat um, that people wanted um, to ask. So um, one of the first ones is, does the flower shape predict the visitation? Yeah, I think I wouldn't feel confident saying like 100% of the time it does. I definitely think there's outliers, but there's definitely trends in that bumblebees will like more open flowers and birds will like um, more like tubular long flowers that they have the beak and tongue that can reach into. And that goes along with what I was saying, like birds tend to like red and bees tend to like blue and yellow open flowers. There's also some trends within bees, like some bumblebees have longer faces than others. So they will often like a flower with a longer neck than the short faced bees. So we do want to do some analysis between the bumblebee species. So hopefully we'll be able to weed out some of those trends, but who knows until we get to it. Okay, cool. So I guess you're able to see the chat. The next question is um, from Patricia. How far do honeybees fly from the hive for nectar and do they displace native bees? That is a great question. I know very little about honeybees, to be completely honest. I, I don't know the distance. I know that there are some bees that travel around a mile from their nest. So I'll throw that number out there. I don't actually know what type of bees that's referring to, though. And do they displace native bees? That is a, a good question. Um, there is some research that shows that they can, if you have a ton of honeybees in one spot, and they're covering all the blooms that can prevent visitation from native bees. But it's not something that I feel super equipped to really answer. I think there, there's like almost some tension between the honeybee and native bee communities. But I think that there is definitely place for both honeybees and native bees. Um, but yeah, there, there are some studies that do seem to show that honeybees will outcompete native bees at a level, but I don't think there's like a lot of data that shows like honeybees are harmful to native bees because they are outcompeting them. Uh, let's see, Georgine asks, where will the bumblebee garden be located? Um, it'll be, if you guys know where the bee lab is, the USGS Fish and Wildlife Service Bee Inventory and Monitoring Lab, it's on the Patexent Research Refuge. So if you go to the bee lab, which they're pretty welcoming to um, have people come volunteer, if you wanted to do surveys there, for sure, any time of the day, Sam would let you in. But otherwise, there's lots of volunteer days for gardening and stuff. So yeah, it'll just be right out front the bee lab, some prime real estate. I hope people check it out. Cool. Is there a best time of day to do the surveys? Jean wants to know. Good question. Um, we say between 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. I think that generally within there, there's no ideal time. Um, you also can sort of push it a little bit, but that's the time frame that we see the most bee activity. Okay. Um, Pat wants to know, are you aware of a few native flower species that almost every type of bee is enthusiastic about? I would have to say I don't think it exists oh. because if I forget what my exact number was at the beginning, but if like 35% or something are specialists and they're, let's say there's a spring beauty specialist and I don't, I don't know many other specialists, but I'll just throw out some, some fake ones. There's a Lismachia specialist right there. Those two cannot like the same flower. In terms of just good bee plants, that's a tough question. I, I know so little about bees beyond bumblebees, like all of the little black size of a grain of rice bees. I haven't even really started looking for those out in nature, so I don't have many recommendations based on that. I have a hunch that the mountain mints and a lot of like sages and other mints are pretty popular, but that's a that's an interesting question. What's like the, what has the broadest appeal? I don't know. Jonathan wants to know, um, related to that, is the study of plant flower evolution to be hospitable to insects something you might get into? Hmm. I am, I love that question. I think that like there is so much to explore in terms of the coevolution between bees and flowers, but I don't know that that's something that's within the scope of this project necessarily. I, I would hope that in my 
career, I get to look into that a little bit. But yeah, I don't think that our data set is super tailored to do that. Uh, Shannon wants to know, have you thought about working with the NWF on their native plant finder tool? I think that is built on Doug Tallamy's data about specialist caterpillars, and it would be cool to integrate bee data. Ooh, I didn't know that that existed. So okay. that is super interesting. I will look into this now. And yeah, I mean, I imagine that this project alone may be like not enough data to match what Doug is sort of done, but I, I would hope we could contribute. And I'll definitely talk to Jared, our botanist about this. Cause I think if anything, he might be the guy to sort of bridge that gap. And uh, let's see, Tony asked, is the bee lab in the middle tract of Patuxent? Access is limited as far as I know. I know one needs to have someone you are visiting for entry, at least it used to be. Okay, I think so. It's it's not the north tract. It could be the south, but it might be middle. Yeah, there is a gate that you um, need to go through with a code that is closed all the time. But when they do these volunteer days, which are generally Thursday afternoons and Saturday mornings, the gate is left open so you can get in without any access. And there's some listservs about that. If you're interested in being adding added to the like planting day listservs, I guess maybe either shoot me an email at uh, Bumblebee count here, or maybe if Elaine would be willing to pass contact information, that would also work for me. Okay, cool. Does anybody else have any questions? It's 8.05, so I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Um, if anyone has questions, feel free to come off mute and um, ask your question. Thank you guys so much. I can't believe that there are like over 20 people who care to listen to me <laughs> ramble about my things. So I really appreciate all the interest in the project and I hope that people yeah, do awesome. participate. Do well, it looks like Kathy has a question. Kathy has her hand up. I just had a comment. Um, oh, hold on one second. You know, about uh, when birds or insects are attracted to non-native plants, that doesn't necessarily mean they're good for them. Um, so, for example, porcelain berry for birds, the, um, the berries actually don't have the lipid composition that they need, so it's like junk food. They'll eat it, and so the bumblebees, like, attracted to some of the non-native um, flowers, it could be, I mean, I don't know for sure, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's good for them just because they're attracted to it and using it. So just something to keep in mind. That's a whole other dimension to, you know, yeah. this whole wow. issue. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. That is such an interesting point. And I wish that we could look into that more. I would love, there's so much that I would love to do, but it would be so cool to look into like the nutrition of native plants versus some of these other plants. Because I imagine like porcelain berry has a place it belongs somewhere and probably the ideal lipid composition for the ecological community somewhere, but- Right, in Asia, where it comes from, sure, you know, different, different right. animal, you know, animal, insects and uh, birds. The birds that eat it there are evolved, the whole idea of evolving with it. So they evolved with that composition. Right. So interesting. Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, your website um, is at the Ohio State uh, University and there's instructions there and there's, um, Lots of good information there, and um, I hope people are interested in uh, participating and collecting some more data for you. Yay. Thank you and so much. This was awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Wow. This has been so fun. Well, thank you so much.